This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis spends five days in the picturesque town of Ariccia for spiritual exercises. Discover with us why the Roman Colosseum is bathed in red light. And stay with us to witness a rare snowball fight in St. Peter's Square. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. An ordinary bus, but with most unexpected passengers, is arriving at the Pauline Fathers Center in the town of Ariccia. Led by Pope Francis, the Roman Curia began their annual five-day Lenten spiritual exercises here at the Chapel of Jesus Divine Master. After the singing of the Vespers, Father José Tolentino de Mendonça went on to preach spiritual exercises. The conferences of this year are focused on the theme of thirst. Father José is a Portuguese priest, poet and biblical theologian who was personally chosen by Pope Francis to lead the exercises. The Divine Master Retreat House is located 20 miles southeast of Rome, surrounded by the dense forests of the Castelli Romani on the shore of the volcanic Lake Albano. To discover more about this picturesque spiritual center of the Roman Curia, we traveled all the way from Rome to Ariccia ahead of the Pope's arrival. The Jesus Divine Master is welcoming visitors at the entrance of the retreat house. The inscription, which is in Latin, says, I am the way, the truth, and the light, pointing to Jesus as the central focus of the spiritual exercises. Father Olinto Crespi is one of the five Pauline fathers that managed this retreat house. He shared with us that the Pope's decision to use this house has completely changed the life of their community. Yes, this town becomes a little Vatican City in a way, and all of us in the community change our lives accordingly. We are five people in the community, all new, so this is our first experience with the Pope. We know that the Pope doesn't get around much, bedroom, chapel, dining room. He speaks very little, even while eating. There's always music in the background. The Pope is going to stay in one of these rooms, walk through these corridors and enjoy the breathtaking views of Lake Albano. The schedule of the exercises of the Roman Curia is simple and they're conducted in the style of St. Ignatius of Loyola. We start with Mass, then breakfast, and then again in the chapel for mediation. We go back to chapel again after lunch. While many other groups gather in the auditorium, the Pope wants to be alone in the chapel. And this says a lot about the atmosphere Pope Francis wants to create. We must keep silent too. I mean, we kind of have to disappear. On the final day of the spiritual exercises, which consisted of only a morning meditation, Pope Francis thanked Father Mendonça for preaching. Thank you, Father, for having spoken of the Church, for having made us, this small flock, feel the Church, and also for having warned us not to shrink it with our bureaucratic worldliness. Pope Francis and the Curia then left the retreat house, returning to the Vatican. Ariccia became famous in 2014, when the Roman Curia started to hold their annual Lenten spiritual exercises here. But the city had already been well known for centuries by pilgrims and pontiffs for another reason. The Shrine of Our Lady of Galloro is the first Marian shrine in the Lazio region. Here, devotion to the Immaculate Conception began even before the promulgation of dogma. Walking through the church, we meet with the rector of the shrine, Father Andrea de Matteis. The devotion to Our Lady of Galoro has very ancient roots. From its origins, the population turned to her with requests for intercessions and miracles. Our Lady of Galoro immediately showed her closeness to the faithful by conceding many graces and miracles. And the people always responded with beautiful devotion a beautiful example of religious life and a beautiful tradition made of historical celebrations, local festivals with period costumes and folklore.
The folklore tradition celebrates the discovery of the miraculous Marian image in the first week of Lent. The invention was a miraculous one. A child who was walking through the valley discovered an image of the Virgin following a fire that destroyed the thorn bushes previously covering it. The fire didn't destroy the surrounding forest, nor did it damage the image. The image was immediately deemed as miraculous and a prodigious one by the people, and the image was brought in procession to the sanctuary of the valley, and it's this very image that now stands in front of us. Another expert of the shrine, Antonio Deli Castelli, says that all of the architecture is designed to underline the immaculate conception of the Virgin. The dome is decorated with the motif of an eight-pointed star. The space inside and outside the star rays is occupied by frescoes representing symbols of the Litany of Loreto, which are all dedicated to the Immaculate Conception, to whom this church has been dedicated since its origin. Antonio says that due to the close vicinity of Ariccia and the summer papal residents of Castel Gandolfo, popes have been frequent pilgrims to this shrine. Alexander VII Chigi did something very important for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. He put a note, a bolla, that turned December the 8th into a universal feast for the veneration of the Immaculate Conception, even before it was a dogma. Pius IX, who promulgated and completed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1854, frequented this church. And in the convent next to it, he had audiences when he would spend a few days here. So as you see, there is continuity of papal presence and also of gifts and important events linked with this sanctuary. However, recent pontiffs haven't visited this shrine and Antonio hopes that one day Pope Francis will celebrate Mass at the first Marian shrine dedicated to the Immaculate Conception. Ariccia is also the city of the Chigi family. They were living right here inside this Baroque palace. The Chigi family have had cardinals, princes and a pope in their dynasty and for centuries were hereditary marshals of the Roman Catholic Church. They were guardians of the conclaves until recent times. Francesco Petrucci, an architect and expert of the place, gives us more details about the extraordinary privilege of the Chigi family. When the cardinals gathered to elect the pope, Prince Chigi had control over the clause of the conclave, stating that the cardinals could not have any exchanges with the outside and should only be guided by the Holy Ghost. This was an hereditary office for many centuries, until Pope Paul VI, who was elected with the Marshal of the Holy Roman Church and Sacred Conclave. As a consequence, we have the keys to the Vatican, the keys to the Sistine Chapel, and a number of objects, which were important for the Marshal, photos of the Sistine Chapel during many conclaves, and many other things connected to the conclave. So the bond with the church was a very strong one. When the Chigi family acquired this building in the second half of the 16th century, they invited Francesco Bernini to turn it into a baroque house. Here in the palace there's a chapel and inside the chapel there's a painting by Gian Lorenzo Benini, who was the greatest Baroque artist in Rome and one of the greatest Baroque artists in general. Benini was a painter, sculptor and architect. He painted a fresco representing St. Joseph with the baby Jesus, which symbolizes fatherly love. The iconography of the fresco is an absolute innovation, since baby Jesus is usually represented with his mother and maternity is a fundamental reference. But here Bernini, who was father to 11 children and who knew fatherly love by experience, decided to represent St. Joseph holding baby Jesus in his arms and holding him close, so much so that the two faces are very close and communicate a sense of protection, almost as if he wanted to transmit his breath to his child. This is a work of great spiritual force. With the arrival of Pope Francis for spiritual exercises here in Ariccia, the town has once again returned to the papal map. Just the latest occasion in a long history as a destination of the popes.
Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Rome woke up covered in a blanket of snow. The Arctic blizzard was so strong, the southern European countries couldn't stave it off. The snowstorm in Rome became a good excuse for kids not to go to school and for adults to show up late for work. How can you work when the Eternal City has been turned into a frozen realm? People abandoned their normal routines and came to celebrate this snowy paradise in St. Peter's Square, some on foot and others on sleds and skis. The square turned into one giant snowball fight and a competition for the best photo on social media. This snowstorm also opened the door for solidarity with those sleeping rough on the streets, and in Rome, a number of shelters opened their doors to protect the homeless from the bitter cold. February 26th went down in history as the coldest day in Europe, and it was the first time in six years that Romans saw snowflakes in the Eternal City. Bishop Saad Sirop Hanna, the apostolic visitor of Chaldeans here in Europe, also the author of a book, Abducted in Iraq, a priest in Baghdad. Amazing, Bishop, you were abducted on the solemnity of the Assumption in the year 2006 by Al-Qaeda. What happened? Well, at that time, I was a parish priest in Baghdad in a zone called Dora, and uh, my church was actually dedicated to St. Jacob of Nasibin. Uh, I, lived, I used to live in the seminary and uh, being uh, also director of studies in Babel College. We had an institute for philosophy and theology at that time it was in Baghdad and I was the director of studies there and a parish priest in St. Jacob. I finished the mass after the mass at that time even uh, uh, because of the situation so many people actually used to leave that area but still the mass was full of people and uh, after the mass when I uh, finished actually I took my car going to the seminary and uh, a group of militants and uh, Belong, uh, belonged to Al-Qaeda at that time and to uh, fanatic Muslims, they abducted me for 28 days. I stayed there for days is waiting for someone to talk. Then in the third four days someone came and they, he started to speak to me. You know, the unknown is always frightening for, 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 the, for the human being. And uh, uh, what is going on? Why me? Why did they took me from my church? But uh, you, know, you know, the situation itself, the threatens, the beating and all this just make, uh, make you very uh, afraid, frightened from what is going to happen. How were you released, Bishop? Well, after 28 days, there were different negotiations, uh, either with the church itself, with, the, with the, my patriarch, at that time was Mar uh, Emmanuel Dali, and uh, then even with my families. Uh, so they, uh, they paid, I think, uh, ransom for, uh, for the releasing, and they, uh, God also, I think, put in their hearts to release me safely without uh, killing me. I think uh, there, was, uh, there was some goals after that, and, uh, and especially to hit the Christian community in that area, to displace so many of the Christians who remained in that area. What did you learn in your book, Abducted in Iraq? 
you talk about a transformative experience. What was that transformation for you? First of all, actually, faith, putting faith in God, in God and only, not in our, what we have or what we know or uh, what we can do. I didn't know what were the exits of this experience, but I, I had this feeling that I am not alone. I was very ready. Sometimes I told God, even in my prayers, if this is my time to be a martyr, then I am okay. Uh, uh, and, and that was for me uh, an a transformative experience. The second thing, there were some gestures from uh, from someone actually them uh, from them actually who just showed me that 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 the people are not bad in themselves. I, they they became they they become bad they, because of the of the conditions of the educations of the ideas that they hold or they learn from their uh, families. So in, uh, I learned to trust more the goodness that in every human being, in every man. Third, I learned that the faith should be, uh, should be uh, testified and should be, uh, should be given as it is. To, not to be afraid to, uh, to declare what, what, what we believe in to have faith in God and to, and to know that Jesus Christ is the only truth can save and can give you also meaning. Today there are 300,000 Christians perhaps in Iraq and uh, what is their situation because that's a much smaller number. Tell us a little bit about the situation today. We don't have real statistics about the numbers of the Christian in, or in Iraq, but we believe that uh, before 2003 there were m more than 800,000 or maybe also a million of Christians in Iraq. We lost two-thirds in these 14 years. Uh, now we will have, in my opinion, and from uh, asking so many priests there in, in different parishes, we will have between 300 to 350 thousands of Christians. How can we help here, the Christians, to remain in Baghdad? In Baghdad. The Patriarch and the bishops, and especially the Chaldean Patriarch, and so many Chaldean bishops uh, called for help uh, from the church outside, from the church here, to, uh, to help Christians to rebuild their villages. The main help comes also from, the, uh, from giving also importance to this portion of Christian, which are very important for the, for, for the whole Christians in the world. Because, you know, Abraham came from, from Ur of Chaldeans, and uh, so these are, uh, this is a very apostolic, ancient church that, 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 that hold, holds a, a very ancient faith. We need to take care of them. We need to make them feel that our closeness to them, and we try also to make the world also knowing of their suffering and and and, and situation. Bishop Saad, uh, we accompany you with our prayers and our support. Thank you for your witness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. The symbol of Christian persecution, the Colosseum in Rome, is preparing to witness once again the tears of those who suffer in the name of Jesus Christ. On this night, the Aid to the Church in Need organization, in a show of solidarity with persecuted Christians around the world, will bathe the Colosseum in red light. We are lighting the Colosseum red because we want to tear the veil of indifference in which unfortunately in our Western countries the media, the international community and even the people are shrouded. Indifference towards who and what, towards the populations, the people and above all the Christians who are suffering because of their faith.
per ragioni di fede. Ai cristiani perseguitati. Si Alessandro Monteduro began the evening by presenting the guests and some highly symbolic figures. The husband and daughter of Asia Bibi, the Pakistani Christian woman condemned to death for blasphemy, and Rebecca Bitrus, a Nigerian Christian lady who was held for two years after she was abducted by Boko Haram Islamist militants. Okay. I was abducted by Boko Haram in the year of 2015 with my two kids. My husband was able to flee for his life, but I had to go with them in the forest. I saw them rape many young girls, both married and unmarried, and in the process I got pregnant from one of the Boko Haram soldiers, and now I have a son from one of the Boko Haram soldiers. Rebecca holds a rosary. She says that the prayer of the rosary keeps her alive and protected during her captivity. She was forced to become a Muslim but refused, and as a consequence she saw the soldiers throw one of her children into a river, a child she has lost forever. After two years of confinement, the government troops managed to free her. At first, when I came to Meduguri town from the forest, I didn't feel to continue to take care of the baby I had with Boko Haram. But the bishop came to talk to me, to continue to accept and love the child, because the child might grow up into an important person in life, a person who could help me. The words of the bishop helped me to accept love and accept the child. Rebecca gave birth to a child on December 25th and named him Cristobal. I am convinced about Jesus' teaching on forgiveness. Jesus was tortured, he was treated unjustly and condemned to death. But even on the cross he forgave those who inflicted pain on him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is one of the teachings that helped me to forgive Boko Haram and the soldiers. These brothers and sisters of ours are the victims of a widespread mentality which allows no space to another and that prefers to suppress rather than integrate anything that seems somehow to question one's certainties. Respect for religious freedom is nothing other than the recognition of the dignity of the human being. Another virus exists, against which we are here tonight in the square, and it is the virus of indifference. We will light the Colosseum red, as we did with the Trevi Fountain, as we did in London at Westminster, in Paris at Montmartre, in Rio de Janeiro, with the statue of Christ the Redeemer, and in Manila, the Philippines, with the intention of tearing the veil of indifference. The St. Elijah Maronite Cathedral in Aleppo, Syria, and the Church of St. Paul in Mosul, Iraq, are in live link-up with Rome and will simultaneously be lit up in red. They gladly came to help us in this moment, which is a very important one also for them to witness their closeness to us. Unfortunately, families haven't returned back here yet. There are only three or four in this neighborhood and very few in Mosul. In the rest of the Nineveh Plains, quite a few have returned. War in Aleppo is over, but unfortunately harsh fighting is still going on in other Syrian cities. The capital, Damascus, has been attacked by many missiles and bombs, therefore the tragedy of many innocent people is still ongoing. With the lives of countless civilians being taken, children, women and the elderly in particular. So in the place, in the Cathedral of Faith, in the place that is the symbol of Christian martyrdom, the Colosseum, we want to tell the whole world that there are many brothers and sisters who are suffering persecution because of their faith. This is the meaning of lighting the Colosseum red and many other monuments that we have already lit. Ashik Masi and Aisham Ashik, husband and youngest daughter of Asya Bibi, are in Rome to bear witness to their struggles and to ask for help for Pakistani Christians. Uh, Beshli came here in Rome to see the Holy Father, Pope Francis, to get his blessing for us and for Asya Bibi. Blessing, yeah. Ashik's wife was imprisoned in 2009 and sentenced to death by hanging for blasphemy. Bibi has denied these charges and the family appealed to the High Court in Lahore, but in 2014 the court upheld the death penalty sentence. However, the family have a strong faith and remain hopeful that Asya Bibi will one day be freed. I will ask the Holy Father to pray for Aju Bibi 
And with this prayer, Aja Bibi will be freed soon and will be again with the family. The family are asking for prayers and seeking financial support in the form of donations as the legal process is still ongoing. Asia Bibi has a strong faith and she is encouraging us, her family, that Jesus Christ is there to support her. And by blessing of Jesus Christ, she would be free very soon and live with the family again. If someone would want to kill us, we would die as Christians and will not convert to Islam. The persecution of Christians worldwide is on the increase. The latest report from the Aid to the Church in Need has estimated that at least 200 million Christians are being persecuted throughout the world because of their faith. Join us next week on Vaticano and learn about the unusual statues of homeless Jesus. Thanks for watching. Thank you.